ladies and gentlemen good morning and good afternoon to all of you uh, this is atul uh, chairing the panel on uh, supporting new education ideas joining you from singapore uh, today as we know we are talking about environment sustainability and governance and uh, the way it is impacting businesses especially post pandemic and and the effect of uh, the wide spread effect of the pandemic on all these aspects of esg are impacting every sector education is no different we are going to have a great discussion today with a uh, with a great eminent panelists joining me here from different parts of the world we have uh, with us uh, ms uh, sushma paul balia she is the president of apj stya and sran group from india we have uh, ms divya lal joining us director from flip learn founder and director from flip learn uh, we have mr rl narayanan also joining us from india he is the vice chairman of center for innovation in in, in education and uh, we have uh, mr sushil premchand uh, a very eminent industrialist uh, entrepreneur uh, in finance as well as historical education projects uh, and uh, he's also joining us from uh, switzerland uh, to begin with uh, let me give a quick overview in terms of what we are going to discuss today of course uh, the topic is uh, going to be at heart very close to heart of many of the speakers of many of the audiences and as we have a steady stream of audiences joining us we are going to have a, a great and very informative session today so with all your permission panel speakers can can we begin please go yes. ahead yes thank you thank you should we perhaps mute so what will education look like after the coronavirus subsides you know will online learning completely replace the traditional instructions will schools have the resources and the social capital to prepare a workforce that can support businesses efforts to comply with the environmental sustainability the social responsibility and the governance standards the covid-19 pandemic is providing the greatest challenge to esg since its inception let's look at some of the factors affecting how schools are adapting and how schools governments colleges and other stakeholders are addressing them. however the shift to remote learning is also widening the disparities in education namely the digital divide in india and elsewhere the digital divide disproportionately impacts students from low socio economic background who rely on public education with more than 700 million people in india lacking the reliable 4g or internet access disparities in learning are only likely to widen if we don't promptly address some of these to prepare for the expansion of e-learning governments and school systems should perform assessments to identify the necessary infrastructure and vulnerabilities together stakeholders can come up with a plan to bridge the divide while there is no one size fits all approach communities can implement a custom combination of various solutions the government will also likely need to create policies and allocate resources for the distribution of mobile devices or laptops to students who cannot afford to have them so that they are not left behind as the virtual classroom becomes the new normal we can expect to see a change in the roles parents and teachers play in the education too teachers on the other hand are taking part of the coaches and mentors guiding students to become self directed learners one of the greatest difficulties associated with remote learning is keeping students motivated furthermore this approach becomes less meaningful when students must direct much of their learning and complete coursework without the face to face support of teachers and their peers educators and curriculum designers therefore will be tasked with the making of lessons fun and authentic subjects 
that are required that require hands on work such as laboratory sciences cannot be taught effectively solely through the digital channels similarly nuances of body language and verbal cues are sometimes lost or distorted during the virtual calls or online chats especially if the connections are interrupted or audio or video capabilities are poor to build a student's communication and social skills teachers should include group work in e-learning modules although it's too early to determine how the pandemic has impacted the learning the numbers suggest that relying exclusively on e-learning can be expected to undermine the student outcomes face to face instruction provides the much needed opportunities to connect with the educators and peers in ways that are simply not possible from a distance with the advent of 5g technology learning anytime anywhere will become a popular concept it could become a habit rather than just an acquired skill for students in the future who will be able to tune in to study materials at their convenience institution will embrace e-learning as a strategic priority ensuring education continuity while the changes and the uncertainties associated with covid-19 pandemic can make it difficult to see beyond the immediate future the situation is also giving us an opportunity to rethink education and what it would look like in the years to come with the right strategies policies and infrastructure we will all be well on our way to consistently support smes as they strive to comply with the ethical measures that retain socially conscious investors may i now call upon our next panelist ms sushma ji to kindly share her thoughts on this topic thank you atul ji uh, i am ms sushma paul balia i am the president of apj satya swaran group i come wearing different hats in education industry and also having led chambers of commerce if we look at today's situation i think issues of environment which is actually health safety environment governance as well as sustainability is no longer just a pressure i think it is absolutely essential for msmes to look towards moving in that direction in order to have continuity and survival as well as well being and long term sustainability in the current situation if we look at it from point of view of education we had to quickly overnight move into virtual mode with the redevelopment of how teaching learning takes place teaching teachers and training teachers on the fly if you will on how to use technology it certainly helped that we were already embedded with lot of technology international platforms like moodle and uh, all kind of learning platforms that helped us to do this overnight but definitely we found issues of digital divide we reached out to all the students who couldn't afford and tried to make up such devices available to them but it's definitely essential for governments to step in on that mode in that context we were also able to um, look at bringing into the classroom not just uh, knowledge in the traditional sense of the term but all kind of skilling techniques as well as activities yoga uh, music dance and bring about a kind of collaborative effort through these various platforms that was very very encouraging simulation was discovered in terms of exposing students for practicals but certainly one needs to be able to do much more beyond that and eventually post covid i do see us moving towards a blended form of learning i think this digital transformation in education is here to stay and we should be encouraged because of the capacity building that is possible both in terms of the teacher resources because not just our own teachers but also having access to industry experts as well as 
academia across the world and be able to reach out and capacity build to far higher numbers and marrying it with the advantages of having smaller group discussions peer learning projects and all of those things in this context with the focus and collaboration that we had with industry it has become increasingly clear that msmes are struggling in or in various areas whether it is in terms of being able to have sustainability for quality for health safety and environmental information ability to mine the information in terms of you know the information overload suddenly they have got on their heads in you know government support uh, you know the various circulars which keep coming in from time to time as well as a whole lot of training and development in being able to access finance how to manage cash flows entrepreneurship this is not just in terms of the owners but also in terms of the employees who are trying to really look at how to develop their skills remanage their supply chains look at hr alignments and all number of things where they definitely need hand holding and i think it is in that context that esg has become the necessity and educational institutions definitely can reach out by building in certificate kind of courses which can lead to diplomas and degrees in a modular appro- approach and in that context be able to uh, reach out to perhaps with the help of chambers of commerce and other such platforms where together academia industry can make all of these courses available of course there is going to be a question that post pandemic how many msmes are actually going to be able to have the time to be able to have access to all of these programs because they are focusing on their very survival as well as how many of these industries are going to be able to as well as people are going to be able to pay for the education that they definitely desperately need and i think this is where the whole of it is important Uh, i would just like to end with the fact that we two things in terms of digital divide we are talking about uh, certainly the availability of cheaper devices but beyond that what is also talking in terms of being able to have courses available through television available through television and all and abilities in addition to this although homeschooling and online teaching may be welcome but we have discovered at least in our experience that there is no substitute for a live resource at the other end if you will of the virtual learning because you do need to find ways and means of keeping students engaged so i can end here uh, with uh, all of this right now and uh, then of course uh, I, you know i look forward to the interaction perhaps the best way i can sum this up is that we started with what was necessary we went on to doing what was possible but i believe that together if industry academia and government and all come together we might be able to do the impossible so thank you thank you thank you sushma ji for that uh, very eloquent and very precise uh, briefing and message from you um we now proceed to our next panel member ms uh, divya lal uh, she is uh, a renowned educator and uh, she has a, a a lot of different experience to share and thoughts to share so over to you divya lal ji thank you atul ji um, and thank you sushma ji for setting the pace of the conversation for us today i think uh, i'm going to start with that first thing which is like on 21st march uh, 2020 the schools in india abruptly shut down and it was in one voice that the whole academy and the industry the edtech industry stood up and said that learning will not stop in our country and that's the true spirit of india because people irrespective of their constraints of devices bandwidth stood up people who had never ever faced cameras switched on a live class and started reaching out to their children uh finding platforms where they could connect so there's a lot of uh, 
you know a uh, spirit and strength about what has happened because what has happened is in india this has been a a, a really a leap frog moment for us you know for all the people who were still wondering about how to use technology into education and how much to really actually become comfortable with different interfaces overnight people learned things overnight people knew how to mute their cameras mute their microphones on a live class how to share files how to upload videos how to embed links and this has been absolutely a moment which is historic actually you know so out of i always say a crisis is too precious to lose and i think in the edtech space in india it is really paving the way for a generation that is far more equipped to bring the best of both worlds learning physically inside a school is not just learning physics chemistry bio it's learning from peers it's learning emotions it's learning the spirit the football field the basketball grounds the assembly the culturals there's so much so obviously you cannot replace one by the other but what we believe by seeing as the edtech industry in the country is very clear that a digital model is going to actually happen there's going to be a space because you know what technology can do very efficiently are things that should continue post covid also for example why do you want your teachers to continue to you know correct those barrage of notebooks all of that has got automated objective assessments automated subjective assessments automated we at flipplan are doing all short answer questions automated assessments so you have to look at how do you value add to the position okay and secondly like i said you know when people talk about technology there is too much expectation for it to be be perfect like a human being i don't know why it becomes like a war between a human and an artificial intelligence this is not a tablet with a full resolve of it you know if you have a crossin it's only going to uh, you know help you with your fever may not help you with let's say maybe a cramp that you're having right so similarly we need to see it in the space it wants to interact so one of the things that i want to leave before i pass it on is that live teaching or using online platforms is not running cinema halls and the moment you understand that piece of not taking a 40 minute classroom into a 40 minute live session rather have a dialogue and a connect and have other ways to reach out and learn you can look at a model that's workable very good thank you mr divya um uh, our next speaker uh is from switzerland mr sushil uh sushil comes from a very eminent corporate background uh has uh, historical links to many of the educational facets of india some of them are legacy and i would now request mr sushil uh to come and share his thoughts this is uh, sushil premchand and i am going to talk on a slightly different tack to the other panelists and i'm going to ad address the theme of educating smes to lift the sdg compliance on environment sustainability and governance post covid i'm going to try and explain that any well structured entity especially one that wants to survive post covid is going to have to be able to meet all or most of the measures of compliance in the natural course of business i'll give you the example of our main business which is an sme which is called pierre sposa pharmacel uh it's based in india we attained to my surprise a platinum level award from our global industry organization which is the sgia to meet three selected SJ, SG, sdgs the award was a consequence of doing the right thing and not specifically trying to get an award my primary point is that we need to focus on accepting that neither quality nor sustainability are cheap but a positive attitude towards esg namely environment sustainability and governance compliance on those pays for itself especially as regards safety in the workplace indeed a number of the sdg goals especially on these esg matters are the logical consequence of proper business management and behavior i believe that we need to reach, reach global standards on these factors and continue until this approach is regarded by serious smes as behaving in the natural course of business this requires direction by the leadership of management 
and the education of these relevant skills to entrepreneurs and our SME peers, especially post-COVID, because we need to survive. Just me recap what these SDGs are and why we were awarded the Platinum Award. Uh, there were the three. Number three relates to good health and well-being. There are a number of points that that covers, including reducing mortality from non-communicable diseases through prevention and treatment, promoting mental health through well-being, reducing the number of deaths and illness from hazardous chemical, con chemical contamination. Number eight is for a decent work and economic growth environment, which requires self-evident elements of growth and work. Number 12 is responsible consumption and responsible production. I don't want to spend too much time on right at this stage and giving you details, but all we did was just the normal thing that we have always done. So my submission to you, which you can discuss in the panel, that formal education is less relevant than general education on the importance of following carefully established procedures, which are not strictures, but are ways of improving performance and improving life in the workplace, making our employees more effective and therefore working towards reaching these sustainability development goals. I believe that education that is required to meet the standards of co governance in terms of these three factors post-COVID is all the more crucial given the competitive environment which, which we will start post-COVID, which will either help or hinder us in becoming a global economic power. I'll end by waiting for further discussion, which will be moderated by Atul, uh, and I can give you plenty of illustrations of things that we did, but I don't want to talk about those in my introductory comments. But what happened was that we didn't try to, but we actually happened to demonstrate our compliance with the SDGs selected. I had no idea that one of our bright young managers thought that we should apply for the uh, to the SGIA, which is now called the Printing United Alliance, for acknowledgement of our efforts. We were positively amazed at the award. I was not surprised on reflection, since we've always tried to do the right thing, which has a cost, one that I feel is worth its weight in gold, or should I say platinum? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sushil Premchand. That was, uh, again, uh, bringing out some of the vital uh, elements of uh, SDGs. Uh, we now go over to Mr. Narayanan. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Narayanan is uh, the Vice Chairman and Center for, Center for Innovation in Education and Empowerment of India. Uh, over to you, Mr. Narayanan. Hello, Mr. Narayanan, are you there? Yeah. Greetings to all of you. Sushma ji opened the panel and Divya did a good job. And again, Sushil ji, your inputs were fantastic. And Atul is doing a great job. See, looking at this entire scenario of post-COVID COVID situation, India and the entire world is facing a very critical situation. Uh, the last 80 years, I would say, the last thing which we faced is something similar to that was in 1930s. So the world is in a much more critical situation, but the human beings as, as uh, a society, as uh, a species, we do extremely well when we are tested with such situations. This is, this is one unique aspect of human being by nature. So that is what is happening across the world. And I would appreciate the Horace's meeting and uh, the, uh, the subject which has been provided here, uh, especially because it so, so nicely correlates with what the Prime Minister of the country has done, uh, Atmanirdar Bharat, which he has done uh, by announcing a package of 20 lakh crores, uh, which is around about 20% of the Indian GDP. And by and large, it's, it's, it stands as one of the best in the world in terms of GDP. Even US has announced only 13% of the entire GDP and Japan has announced 21%. So we are collectively doing something to stimulate the economy. So that, I think that by uh, that idea is going to propel India into a $10 trillion uh, uh, economy. This, I see that after interacting across the verticals, be it industry, be it education, be it pharma sector, and I'm privileged to be in the panel of U.S. and at least 50 different countries for PPE procurement. So I keep talking to various people. At least I have spoken to thousand thought leaders across the world in the last two, three months. So I find that this situation is being handled by India extremely well. 
And what it has done more, I would say, from a macro perspective is, see, we have been set into a particular pattern of education for the last uh, 200 years, I would say, which was meant for clerical talent and managerial talent and office management talent, by and large, I would say, administrative talent at the best. So we did not have an opportunity to explore and question and do things in an, in, in an innovative way, the way education has to be. That was not the case in India. It was so unfortunate. But but for a few institutions like IIT or the top schools, if you leave the outliers, I would call these outliers, except for these outliers, we have not done well in terms of producing extremely good talent in science or in, in business or various other things. But what is unique to India is entrepreneurial talent. We, in fact, we, the COVID, we have been surviving. I've listened to various panels, speakers, even including Minister Piyush Goyal. They have repeatedly pointed out that what made India survive the local grocery shop, the local entrepreneur, the local farmer, the local mindset of business spirit as healthy the country solve many problems. So I would say that the education in some way should connect to the grassroots what the country requires, what the society requires, and shape it into a form of learning. So this has given a break for us to think and to look forward. As Divya pointed out so nicely, we have adapted to situations so quickly. People are not used to video, are learning so fast, and their adaptive nature is Indians by nature, they are adaptive. That is what is, uh, is uh, ours is one of the world's surviving civilization because of our adaptability. So we have to learn from this, uh, this uh, past and go into the adaptive thing. And this is an opportunity for us to break from the past and leave the mean, mean of the class. So the classroom environment is definitely good. But it also averages out the good comes becomes the, the, the comes into the average and the people who don't learn, they also average out. So in a 60 people classroom, teachers cannot do much. So this gives an opportunity for students also to look beyond classrooms. That is something unique, I would say. So in this model, even if you come out with, the, say, a few thousand leadership materials because of the self-learning progress, which is available uh, because of this COVID situation and parents and teachers and uh, students are looking at it as an opportunity, I see this as something which will propel India to a $10 trillion economy. Right. Yeah, so Narayan, Mr. Narayan, that was good. I think uh, we have uh, uh, we have been uh, getting some very good messages from our audiences as well. And uh, let's, let's begin. We have some 20 minutes now to go into some of the audience questions. Uh, Mr. Avinash Garlapati from uh, his operations manager and his question that you can see is what will be the challenges in supply chain and pain areas and what are the pain areas in supply chain? How will the supply chain analytics supplement and also healthcare? Uh, would any of the panelists would like to take that question? I would, I would, I would answer that. See, looking at India's supply chain, as I said, that I've been talking to the logistics players also. Uh, in one of the largest uh, logistic players is also a friend of mine. So I would say that, see, looking at the supply chain, again, this is an opportunity, looking at the Minister of Railways who is speaking. So how are the chairman of Tata Steel immediately commented, today's session, live session in Horace's, I say that this is has been, this panel this has been extremely careful by the, the uh, Frank, uh, we have selected this panel very well. So the panel, uh, one of the panelists, uh, this chairman of Tata uh, uh, South, Tata Chemicals, has commented that how railways has been critical in supplying the salt to each and every villages. The railway network has completely focused on, because of this COVID situation of the supply chain, how it has helped them. It was a comment available in our screen today. So looking at this situation, this is also an opportunity because of Atmanir Bar Bharat to create cold, st cold storage in every district where the government has to take action. And we already have the existing infrastructure. As I say that we have the infrastructure that is has to be put into use at, uh, with the, the high quality leadership in place. So if we are able to collect this and give a kind of education which is necessary for management of the uh, particular uh, district or particular village with regard to that, as uh, Sushmaji was also pointing out, that we require an educational attitude change 
that what as a so to bring the social entrepreneurship and develop that and to provide solutions so we have the opportunity that it has been tested that we have infrastructure to create a, a, a specific storage situations and supply chain management situation solutions to the country and we also need to train students especially in that 16 17 18 years people who want to grow into supply chain management because we have amazon we have flipkart we have everything today which is all about supply chain and logistics management and even including this atmanirbhar bharat it can do very well only if we manage the supply chain correctly without that uh, uh, it would be difficult and one of the panelists today was pointing out that we need to create cold storage situation because india is 60 70% a village dependent economy still and our employment has to come from that so we need to create infrastructure in each and every villages especially the cold storage and that also relates to a topic of smes and msmes that can support that area smes and msmes and including the schools which can provide a particular type of education they are required skilling required for this management of these spots so i would say that this everything is interconnected in this and management of supply chain is very very critical if we have to move towards a central in dollar economy absolutely i think well said uh, mr narayan and, and i think the the value of supply chain today even though we were in a lockdown in many parts of the world i think supply chain worked beautifully uh, i i just give you an example there was a small medicine required from somebody uh, for a, for an old gentleman in singapore and the medicine actually flew from Uh, there are going to delhi delhi to germany germany to china china to singapore and within 10 days it was here but i think the relevance in terms of local uh, national levels uh, it is just creating a new renewed focus on all these logistics and some of these uh, you talked about narayan let's take one more question again from mr vinash what will be the academics post covid uh, post lockdown in india um, sushma ji or divya ji i can on you know, that ji thank you uh, i was just going to quickly say that i think we do with the definitely post covid we see a blended model going ahead and there needs to be a complete relook at the way teaching learning takes place teacher training is going to become very important and there has to be a complete focus on relooking at our curriculum in terms of the outcomes that we see because the current outcomes which are purely more knowledge based need to become translated into knowledge skill attributes and values some of the most important learning in this period has been that companies who have done well individuals who have done well and are managing to survive and remain positive and move through this period are people who have learned the ability to be entrepreneurial you don't need to be entrepreneurial to run an enterprise even if you're working for somebody you need the entrepreneurial capability and outlook the kind of human values that allowed us to look at the welfare of all of us together and be able to work in a, a environment and work with each other and bring about that kind of motivation and positivity on people and things around us and resilience to be able to face up to situations and to be able to uh, not get into depression negativity and all those things many people have been haunted with most of all we will need to ensure digital enablement across the board we will need to enable an innovative and creative mindset and i think this pandemic sometimes they say there is an opportunity in every crisis i believe this is an opportunity where overnight we can transform the education whether it is through our schools and whether it is our higher education to truly be able to partner with social uh, groups with industry at large to be able to deliver the kind of education which it truly builds the kind of human resources which can take our economy forward in the right direction the good news is that i have found that whether it is the ugc the all india council for technical education and is even cb cbsc and clearly the credit goes to the government in that context have come up in a very flexible and positive approach towards enablement of these kind of initiatives 
I'm hoping that this will continue post pandemic so that we can truly take advantage of, of the opportunities that have opened up. Right. I'm mindful of the time. And as we speak here, uh, let's take one question from uh, Peter Perret. Uh, he's the professor at U.S. Northwestern. And he says, could we integrate cost model virtual collaboration between our countries in education through virtual practice, uh, virtual collaboration between India, Switzerland, Singapore and other countries? Um, so who would like to take that? Uh, I'll take that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll take that. And I think I'm sure uh, uh, Sushilji can add post me. So quickly, just to add my thoughts, um, actually, you know, Atulji, we are at the brink of not only while I support about 3.5 million children online today, and in the last 60 days, about more than 200 schools have already joined in to go online. Uh, we are launching virtual schools now. Okay, so one of the bigger school brands has come to me and said that earlier when I had to launch a school, I needed a land and a building and so many other things. Today, I have the, I have the academic prowess. Okay, I have the philosophy. I have the brand. So I'm in the process of launching a pilot batch for a school. And what Peter is saying over here is going to be an integral part of it. Because now, not only as a tuition center or a support, but I can bring you the best possible experiences from across the globe to create a school experience for children, which will be maybe digital and are largely digital by nature. So there is some a very, very drastic thinking that's happening in the industry. You know, people are really thinking about that uh, today I can attract thousands of children who could be any part of the country and launch a school. Okay, or children outside India who may be looking at a relocation in a couple of years and can get and start studying here and then get faculty from within the country, outside the country on basic spheres. And like you said, you could have collaboration programs running. So it's it's a very, very fantastic time and space in the ed tech industry in India where people are really breaking the barriers. You know, I always say this. Uh, it is the digital migrants like us who are trying to, you know, define the contours for digital natives and that's why i tell people it's more in our minds than in the minds of the children to talk to a child today studying online they don't have 50 percent of the issues that we will talk about as issues because they can easily navigate through everything right so we also have to break our barriers into this phenomenon so shilji uh, please add I yes so sorry if i may atul uh Two points. One is that I think that the Indian is by nature a brilliant self-educator by providing the environment. Uh, for example, Zoom has led us in business to get rid of three branch offices because we didn't need them. We always thought we had them. There was sort of a silo mentality that actually COVID has begun to break, which I think is a very positive long-term development. But to take Peter Perrett, who I know very well because I've been working with them on a particular project for very many years now. And I think that one of the likely developments is that because English is a common language and India is a master of uh, English, sometimes written with an I instead of an E, but it's still comprehensible. The, the, the point is that, for example, Peter, Peter's school in his university, the University of Northwest Switzerland, has multiple campuses, but a lot of their courses are now in English. And so this provides the ability to interact across borders. And I think that the natural uh, agility of mind of the Indian will make it possible to actually jump across these borders using uh, the technology of education in different locations. This was the comment on supply chains. I mean, it did not take very long I mean, I think that the, the discussion on supply chain is not really to do with education, but to the educated mind realized very quickly in our organization that the supply chain from China for a lot of raw materials uh, coming also from multinational companies, but coming to India from China, people said, well, hang on, we can do the same. Uh, you know, we have the ability to think across silos once the silo is broken. I think that's a very positive development. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Nathin, Nitin Datta uh, and sorry, Darshan Lama. Darshan Lama, and he says, What are the panel's thoughts on virtual augmented reality enabling the spatial and physical inclusion in online learning? Do you want to take that, Divya? 
Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, actually, there are some very interesting companies. While I don't work in the uh, virtual and the augmented space, but I have partners across that. There are some budding companies based out of Hyderabad and Bangalore, okay, uh, who are doing, and even in Noida, who are creating a full augmented experience without children needing devices to see it through, just by using digital pieces, etc. So there is, uh, like I said, you know, path breaking stuff happening at very, very nominal cost. And something aligned that Sushma ji said at the start of her first piece, it's not just about the privileged class which has devices. What are we doing about 80% of the children who don't have an access to a smart device or something? If the governments across the country are working on some very interesting programs to put this on television, okay? So I myself are in work with because the, you know, the content that is e-content is not TV format. So you need to, you know, kind of work through and create a different thing. But amazing work, and you will see this, Atulji, in the next 15, 20 days, how different things will launch out on state channels on helping children reach out. Because television brings your access from 25, 30% to immediately to 75, 80%. Parallelly, there are work. We are also doing some work on radio to bring this up. So, you know, India with its diversity on cultural, socioeconomic strata piece has to have a multi-pronged approach to ensure children with whatever means have access and you know access and quality both aspects right uh, we have a question from rajiv call our, our good friend uh, rajiv says post covid era where digital video will continue to be extensively used uh, should help greatly in bridging the educational divide in india any thoughts from panel members yeah so i think uh, definitely it's going to make a huge difference because at the end of the day, we are not only going to be streaming content in terms of virtual schools or even in terms of virtual learning, but <clears throat> we have looked at, uh, we are looking at putting content on YouTube. Divya has just talked about the initiative that the government has taken in terms of Vidya Dan and putting together content for television in a very innovative way. For example, we have been working in our architecture college with the local, with our state university in Uttar Pradesh, where recorded lectures by all the professors are available, not only to all the colleges on all parts of the interiors as well in that particular state and for that matter, the country, but have been posted on YouTube and all sorts of things. I believe this kind of learning is here to stay. It's going to make a huge difference and we'll be able to bring the best of teachers, experts and learning to the very, very interiors of all the schools and all the colleges, which here too were relying only on the local teacher. And so with the augmentation of that kind of information, that kind of access, that kind of knowledge and skills, which can be augmented as we go along, it will make a huge difference in bridging that divide. Right. Yeah, um, I would like to add, I would like yes. to add uh, shortly. See, what Sushma Ji has said is very right. So even this augmented reality is going to definitely redefine the education and the way we learn things. So if you want, if you want, for example, I was in Germany looking at the BMW museum. How can you learn in, in a 2D way a, a four-stroke four engine? You can only learn in argumented reality about the four-stroke engine. So this will definitely provide a faster learning. And as Sushma Ji and Divya was pointing out, this country lacks infrastructure in terms of capable teachers to cover the entire spectrum of students. And online, surely this post-COVID situation has opened doors that is going to propel an engine called India to a next orbit. This is surely an opportunity, a paradigm shift, an orbit shift experience for the country in space of education, definitely. Sure, sure, very well said. Uh, you know, when you talk to many of these universities uh, around the world, and I can, I'm private to some conversations here in this part of the world, uh, there is a very serious thought of moving programs. And I was told that one of these universities out of uh, Singapore is moving their e-learning, e-MBA program completely on an e-learning model uh, starting uh, next half of this year. And I think this is exactly, I saw uh, a U.S. university already launching their courses in India. Uh, so this is 
we are going to see a paradigm shift in the way the business model is uh, delivered and we are going to see a lot of innovation that is coming out in this space i take a last question from uh, chitra mujindar and he says i think the future of education is here to transform learning from knowledge based to reasoning based where machine where machine is as well ethically trained not alex or google or siri so he is is expecting sushil sushil ji or divya ji to kind of give some inputs in that i just like to add one general comment which is that you know time is up anyway but i would just like to add the comment that i think that the sme today which is the team that we are talking about has to learn to follow esg and not look at the immediate direct cost but the long term benefit because the world is going to expect people to comply with the sdgs to the extent that they can and if they are non compliant they will not get the business so to be competitive which is the element of survival and they're going to have to self educate to grow this knowledge base and to be agile enough to uh, make it profitable and grow with that absolutely so yes no i'm just saying just responding to chitra's uh, chitra ji's uh, comment see when we look at using technology we're all saying it's going to be digital we're not taking away the physical experience and replacing it it's going to be a blend like we are saying and secondly um, it's not about so much about you know trying to compare human competence with ai i think the idea is to use the tools use it like you use a blackboard in a class you use a learning platform that is how it is so we don't have to value it and build it up so much that we you know we start contesting you know is it as well ethically trained and is the system going to do this i think we should just leave it and use it like any technology piece like a laptop that we use and we don't think so much about you know giving it that much of credit credits beyond the point right thank you so much yes sir time is up uh, we are 2 minutes over to shriyu but i would uh, then finally wrap up to say thank you everyone for joining us on this panel thank you audience uh, we've had some great participation from you and thank you for those questions i also wish to thank sushma ji divyalal ji naran ji and sushil premchand ji for giving their very very eloquent thoughts on this various uh, topics and especially with the environment sustainability and governance impacting all industries education is no different with that we sign off from here uh, from today's session and thank you so much for joining us thank you namaskar everybody bye bye god and thank you to the chair as well thank you thank you thank you everyone